Yeah, thank you for the invitation. And it's unfortunate I wasn't, I'm not able to be there in person, but you know, I saw the talks online, some of them looked really interesting. So yeah, too bad. But uh, uh, so I want to tell you what is this work from like last year that is a little different than the other talks we had so far, but is also related because it connects uh, algebra and combinatorics, but more motivated from computer science applications. Um, so hopefully it'll be interesting. And this is joint work with uh, Alexander Nope, Sam McGuire, and Wei Xiang Wan. Okay. So here's the overview for the talk. I'll start with a brief overview of Boolean functions. What do we want to understand about the monomials of Boolean functions and the structure? And then I'll tell you about two interesting connections. One is our, well, our original motivation to study this problem. <clears throat> Related to a conjecture called the Lagrange conjecture, so probably many of you have heard about. And then also, then we realize it has connections to another famous conjecture in combinatorics called the unit closed conjecture. So I'll tell you about those. Uh, that's going to be the majority of the talk. And then toward the end, I'll tell you some stuff about the proof and, and open graphs. Okay, but, but mostly, I want to convince you why this problem is interesting, and there's still you know, more work to be done. So, monomials of Boolean functions. By the way, this is what comes up when you type in Google, so I don't know. I guess this is the monomials. Um, so what's, 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 our, what's our hero here? So we have an, a Boolean function, uh, f, from n bits to you know, one bit. And you know, we can write any Boolean function uh, using its multilinear uh, extension, it's a polynomial. It's a multilinear polynomial, and just write as a sum of you know, coefficients, right? And I'm using here the following notation that I've used throughout the talk. So x to the power s. So x is a set of variables, x1 to xn. s is you know, some subset of 1 up to n. So that's just a monomial. And what we're going to ask about is that, let's say you give me a Boolean function. And now I'm just taking all the monomials that appear in its expansion. And I ignore the coefficient. So I'm just going to look on the set system formed by the monomials of an arbitrary Boolean function. And the question is going to be, what can we say about the structure of such set system? Can it be an arbitrary set system? Or does it need to have special structure because it comes from a Boolean function? That's going to be the motivating question. Yeah. So let's look on two basic examples just to start motivating it. So the first is the end function. So the end function takes n bits and return one if all of them are one and return zero otherwise. And when you write the so no, just a product of all the variables. So notice here the variables take zero, one value. So just multiplying them in the end function. And it's very simple as a polynomial, just a single monomial, the simplest it could be. Now let's take a very related function, the O function. So the all function returns one if at least one of the inputs is one. But when you write this polynomial, it looks very complicated. It has basically all the monomials except for the constant one. So somehow, if you just look at the set system of monomials and it looks very simple, it's a single monomial, or now becomes very complicated, has many, many monomials, almost all of them. And what we're going to try to understand, and I'll give you some motivations later why it's an interesting question, is what are the Boolean functions that have few monomials? Can we sort of try to characterize it or understand something about the structure? So okay, this just repeats what I just said. So if you do like a simple check, then many Boolean functions we usually study, simple ones like O or parity, like solid bits or random functions are going to look complicated. So we really expect there'll be very simple functions to look simple in this model where we just count the number of monomials in them. So we saw one example end. And you can ask, what, is the, what are other natural examples of Boolean functions that have few monomials? So I want to show you another very natural source for such examples that look very different than the end function. And this is this model called decision trees. So decision trees is a very well-studied model in computer science, you know, and it has many applications. It's basically some decision diagram. And how do we view it as a 
Boolean function, so take in this example as a tree. So tree of depths two, and the root has a variable x1. So I'm going to query the variable x1. If the value is zero, I'm going to go to the left. And if the value is one, I'm going to go to the right. And then I'm going to choose some other variable. Maybe if I go to the left, I'll query x2. And based on its value, I'm going to now give you the answer. And maybe for on the right, I'm going to query another variable, let's say x3. So you can expand this as a polynomial. And you'll see that this specific example is, is relatively sparse, had only four monomials. And what I want to show you that this is not by accident, any decision tree is going to give us a sparse polynomial. So that's going to be a very simple exercise. I'm actually going to show you the proof. I mean, it's good to start with simple statements and simple proofs to get things going. So here's a claim. Any Boolean function that you can compute by a depth the decision tree has at most three to the d monomials. So if this is small, that's not going to be, you know, that's going to be sparse. Now, just for comparison, the maximal number of monomials you could have is two to the n, right? All the possible subsets of the variables. So if d is much less than n, that's much less than two to the n. So what's the proof? They're just induction on d. The base case is d equal to zero. They have constant functions. It's either zero or one. They have, you know, either zero or one monomials. And then just by induction, you'd say, well, if my decision tree queries, let's say x1 at the top, and then on the left goes to, if you get, if you get zero, you, get, you query some left function that has depth d minus one. And if you get one, you query some other function that, that you know, if you get one. Here's you, what I found online. Then you can just basically write the expression. And you see that, you know, by induction, if fr and fl are going to be sparse, then f is not going to be much, we're going to have many more monomials compared to them. And concretely, if you know by induction, the left and the right side, they have depth d minus one, they have at most three to the power d minus one monomials. So just simple calculations show that our function has at most three to the d. So that was very simple. So we saw for part two natural examples for Boolean functions are sparse. One is the end function or just monomials. And the other one is, N, is this decision tree model. But they look very different from each other. And so we said we had end, we have decision trees. So really what we're trying to find is some, uh, some way of you know, combining them into one model that allows both ends and decision trees. And turns out that there's actually such a model, which you know is appropriately named end decision tree. So maybe just as a sanity check, end of all the bits require a very deep decision tree to query all the bits. And decision trees don't look like ends, right? So these two, these two examples are so different. So we need to somehow marry them together. So what are end decision trees? And it's going to be a model combining ends and decision trees. And it basically, it's better to understand by example. So it's like a decision tree, except that the node, I don't query a variable, but I query the ends of some large subset of maybe small subset of variables. So maybe here as a root, I query a monomial x to the a. So I ask, is it true that all the bits in a are one? And I get yes or no, zero or one, so I query the end. And if it's zero, if this one of them is zero, I query some other monomial. And if it's one, I query some third monomial. And you see, if I write, if I, if I write out the polynomial here, then it has high degrees. These monomials are big, but it's still very sparse. On his sparsity four, so it was decision trees of depths two. So querying ends instead of variables doesn't increase sparsity of the polynomials. So now we have this, this end decision trees, and very similar to the claim before, you can prove it using exactly the same proof that if you get a depth the end decision tree, it's going to be sparse. And now is where the fun begins. Here we're going to ask: Is this the only such example or family of examples? And this is what we're going to show. I mean, there are going to be some quantitative losses, but you know, after them, the only functions, Boolean functions that have few monomials are computed with, by end decision trees. And actually, crucially for us, you see the depth here is D. You get exponentially many monomials in D. So really, we're going to try to understand this exponential relation. So really, what we'd hope to say that if your Boolean function has some number R monomials, you should have something like log R depths. So getting this, this quantitative bound to be tight is actually important. Because with qualitatively, it's easy to show. So this, the quantitative bounds are important here. 
So here's going to be our main structure of results that I want to tell you about. And then I'll tell you why it came up, studying the Lagrange conjecture and how it's related to other conjecture and to combinatorics and to algebra. So it said the following thing. Take any Boolean function, and let's assume the number of monomials is some small m. Then what you could prove is that there is an end decision tree whose depth is pretty small computing it. So what, what do we mean pretty small? So we know log m is necessary. We have these examples. And we got poly log m. But that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, one thing that's really annoying is this extra log n factor here it actually depends on the number of variables that I might tell you at the end why it comes up. And it's really annoying because it prevents us from various applications that requires to have no dependence on the number of variables. So, so people who like these type of questions about structure, that's an interesting open problem to get rid of the slogan factor. Um, and I really conjecture that the right answer should be this end decision tree example, order of log m should be the right answer. We have no other or no better uh, separation. So why not conjecture it? Okay. Now really this main structural result, it seems a bit complicated, but it actually hinges on a purely combinatorial statement about the structure of monomials of Boolean functions. So this was really a, a motivation for some applications, but I'll tell you, but really I'm gonna focus on this core combinatorial result. So here's a core combinatorial result. So let me first say it qualitatively. If you take set systems of monomials of Boolean functions, they cannot be arbitrary. They're always going to have small hidden sets, meaning they're always gonna be a small set of variables that intersect all the monomials. So they have a lot of structure in them. And let me just make some definitions. I mean, they're pretty standard definitions. Let F be a set system, so a family of sets. We call a set H a heating set for this family if it intersects all the non-empty sets in your set system. Okay, so it's usually definition of a heating set. So this is really the main technical result. And this is where all of the fun happens. So take any, Boolean function on n bits that have m monomials. And now just look at the set system of the monomials. So what we prove that there is a hidden set whose size is polylogarithmic in the number of sets. So that's very special because if you, it's easy to come up with set system that have, don't have small hidden sets. For example, if you take a set system where all the sets are disjoint, then you need something like m variables to hit all the sets. So this really tells us that Set systems that come as monomials of Boolean functions are not generic. They have special structure. So of course, this doesn't capture all of it, but this is maybe a first step towards understanding the special structure. So now what I want to tell you is why did we care about this question and how it connects to these two conjectures, the log rain conjecture and uh, the union close conjecture. And then I want to tell you how like some, some stuff about the proof. Okay, but then before I do that, let me see, are there any questions about the statements or the definitions? No, perfect. Yeah, please, please stop me if there are any questions. So first, the connection to the log rank conjecture. So the logarithm conjecture is this very famous open problem that came up in several areas, you know, in mathematics and in computer science. It actually came up originally in graph theory, uh, but then it came up in communication complexity, in geometry, in other areas. And all these questions are just sort of excuses for studying the structure of low rank Boolean matrices. So this is really the mathematical question. You have a matrix that is both low rank and Boolean. What kind of structure should it have? So you see, we're connecting a, an algebraic property, low rank, to a combinatorial property, which is having Boolean entries. So what's the setup? So let A be an n by n Boolean matrix. I mean, the entries are 0, 1. And it's, we assume the rank of this matrix is not n. It should be true for like a random matrix, but it's very small. It's R. And R is much, much less than n. Think of ours maybe being root n or log n or poly log n, something much less than n. And also importantly, although I won't talk about it much in this talk, we compute the rank over the reals where the rank is maximized. So it's a real rank. And really we're asking what is the structure of such matrices? 
So how can we construct them? So here's one way to do it. Assume you give me this matrix and there's some way of decomposing this matrix into some number R of submatrices that are monochromatic, meaning that every submatrix is either all zero or all one, like maybe in this example here. But I'm claiming in this case, the rank of the matrix is at most R. Why? Because I can just write my matrix as the sum of the submatrices and every submatrix has all zero or it's a rank one matrix. And basically the log rank conjecture said that this, that's up to some, let's say minor quantitative losses, that's the best you can get. There's nothing else. That's the only structure. Uh, more, what's, what, what are these quantitative losses? So this is really the, the conjecture. It said, let A be a Boolean matrix whose rank is R, then it can decompose into capital R, monochromatic rectangle. Capital R is maybe not R, but it is quasi-polynomial in R. So maybe it's R to the log R or R to the log squared R, but close enough to R. So what do we know about this conjecture? Actually, the original conjecture that came up, you know, in graph theory and then in communication complexity was stronger. They said, why, why, why should they conjecture quasi-polynomial? They conjectured O of R or polynomial in R relation, but that, those turned out to be false. People came up with, you know, better and better counterexamples. And the best examples we know today, the best constructions, show that C, this constant C here, has to be at least two, meaning capital R should be at least R to the power of small log R. So it should be at least quasi-polynomial. And that's the best that we know after, I don't know, maybe 50 years of, you know, the community thinking about this problem or different communities thinking about it. Uh, so just maybe, it's, and, and there are many examples showing that. So, so maybe that's believable. Uh, but, but we don't know how to prove it. Uh, there's a trivial way of getting a bound that's exponential. And a few years ago, I proved a bound that is still exponential, but not in the rank, but with the rank. And that's the best that we know. And since sort of we don't know what to do beyond that, it makes sense to look on special cases. And it turns out if you view this from the lens of communication complexity, there's actually a very natural way to come up with a rich family of examples or special cases to consider. And to do that, it's going to be convenient to think of the following equivalence. So instead of thinking of a matrix, we're going to think of it as a function where one player gets an index of a row, the other player gets an index of a column of the matrix, and the goal is to compute the entry in this row and column. So that's a function they're trying to compute. So or maybe forget, even forget about players. It's a function of two inputs, a row and the column to the entry. Right? It's, it's the same with the matrix. But this is going to be a convenient way of viewing it. And then you do the following thing, which can, I think the first time you see this looks complicated. So I want to go through this carefully, because I think it's a very rich theory of examples that people should be aware of, even if the study problems are not related to this, that problem coming up in additive combinatorics or other fields. Um, so this is what's called lifted function. So a lifted function is going to be a, a function from some domain to some domain to zero, one to the matrix. But it's built from two different components. The first component we're going to call an outer function. It's going to be a Boolean function f, like the one we were studying in the beginning, but it's monomial structure. So an arbitrary Boolean function. And the second part, g, is what we're going to call a gadget. So it takes two inputs, one in domain X, one in domain Y, and outputs a bit, zero, one. And we're gonna combine them to create what we call the lifted function, whose domain is X to the N times Y to the N to zero, one. And what you do the following thing, so just compose them. So you apply, so your, your row of this matrix, you can think of as indexed by a tuple X one up to XN, and the, co and the column is indexed by a tuple Y one up to YN. You apply G on X one, Y one, G on X two, Y two, and so on. on. You get n bits and you apply the Boolean function to that. So turn out by, by playing with different gadgets, you get many different sources of examples that people have studied. And concretely, if you think of G as being the, what we call the end gadget, just these are two bits, now thinking of X and Y as just being two bits, and they're just taking their end. Turns out that if you look at this matrix that you get in this process and you compute its rank, which is what we cared about for this log rank conjecture the rank is exactly the number of monomials of the Boolean function small f. So there's a very natural way of connecting the monomials of a Boolean function 
to this special case of examples of matrices that you want to understand the connection between the rank and the combinatorial structure. And this is what motivated us to study this question. And what we can do is almost prove the log rank conjecture in a special case of these n functions, because if you take everything we did and ignore the details, I mean, there's some standard machinery you could apply. What you get is if the rank of the matrix is small r, then you can decompose it into the following thing. There will be a quasi-polynomial in R, but there is extra annoying log in term depending on the number of variables that really shouldn't be here. The number of variables should not be an important parameter here, but we, for some technical reasons, we can get around it. And if we could get around this log n, this would actually be a proof with you know, the exponent here being five, which is still reasonable. And also another reason why it's interesting is because if this log rank conjecture is false, it's probably false for some structural examples, not for random matrices. So when you try to understand this type of structural conjectures, it makes sense to study special cases because often if the conjecture are false, then you're going to find the counterexample from some structural examples. So this was our motivation. This is what we can prove using this combinatorial result. And now I want to tell you about sort of a different application that we, or a different connection that we found later to the union closed conjecture. But maybe before that, are there any, connect, any questions about this connection to the log rank conjecture? Do you have better examples for n functions? Or so do the examples that you mentioned that give a lower bound of the general log rank, are these n functions as well? Or so the examples are, you can get, you can get quasi polynomial separations within n functions. I think the best examples don't use n, they use a slightly more complicated gadget here, but in spirit, know. yes, yes. But you, you can get the quasi polynomial suppression even with n function. This was one of the original examples found. I was just wondering whether the two lower bound, I mean, whether you can do polynomial maybe. Or, maybe. No, so I think they're the 1.6 lower bound. Okay. So you, you, do, you do need quasi polynomial even for n functions. Maybe not two, but at least 1.6. Okay, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. So now let me tell you about this connection to the union closed conjecture. So that's like a very famous conjecture in combinatorics. It is very simple to state and sort of apparently very hard to solve. So let F be a set system. We say it's union closed. If for any two sets in the set system, the union is also in the set system. And the conjecture that is now attributed to Frankel from the 80s, or maybe even before, depends who you ask, is the following. If you have for any union set, closed set system, there is an abundant element. It's an element that belongs to at least half the sets. And one example, if you take you know, all the subsets of, you know, let's say, 1 up to n, then you know, every element belongs to exactly half the sets. And the conjecture that in any union closed set system, maybe not all elements, but at least one element should belong to at least, at least half the sets. And you know, many people have studied it, there are many examples, and it's true in all of them, but still, those, we really don't know how to solve it. Seems like a very hard question. Um, and so, how is this related to, to the structure of monomials? So, maybe before that, I'll tell you one thing that we know about it. There's this following very simple claim that probably many of you have seen, but if you haven't, then it's good to at least be aware of it. It said that if you have a union closed set system of some size M, then there is a small heating set for the set system of size about log M. In particular, one of the elements in this heating set hits a large fraction of sets in the set system. And that's basically the best that we know. And the proof is so simple, it's going to fit on the bottom of the slide here. And embarrassingly, that's the best that we know for general set systems. So what's the proof? So the proof is the following. Let H be a minimal heating set for your set system. Now, because it's minimal, it means that for every X element X in the heating set, there must be some set SX in your set system that intersects the heating set in exactly this one element. And now you just say, well, because the set system is union closed, all the unions of the sets SX 
are in your set system. So if you consider the intersections with your hidden set, you're going to get all subsets of your hidden set, except maybe the empty set. And that's it, that's a proof. So very simple, and that's all that we know, basically. I mean, there's actually a work, complicated work of workshop improving this one to like two point something, but using much, much more complicated proof. But asymptotically, that's the best that we know. So how is this related? So let's, let's say now we go back to our set of, of Boolean functions and let's look at the monomials. Now, here's like a basic observation. Because f is a Boolean function, if I square it, I'm gonna get back to the original function because every value is either zero or one. And now let's look at the polynomial expression for f squared. So what are we going to get? It's gonna be the sum of all subsets, S and T of variables. F, S, F, T, the product of these coefficients times the monomial. So you see very naturally, what you get here is the unions of monomials. So if somehow by luck, there were no cancellations, I mean, in, for every S and T, every two monomials, the union also appeared in F squared. So in F, I mean, if this sum over S and T given some union didn't somehow magically cancel, then we would get that the set system of monomials is union closed. But of course, it's not, there are many examples where there are cancellations. It's, Boolean functions are a much more complex uh, object compared to union closed set systems. It has many, it's more rich. But really what we show is that it's set system, while it's not union closed, it shares some similarities with union closed set systems. I mean, if for union closed set systems, we know for hidden set of size logarithmic, here we get polylogarithmic. That's one connection. Here's another connection. Let's say you take a union closed set system. So here's a claim. You can find a Boolean function that is supported on the set system. What does it mean? There is a way of finding non-zero coefficients for every set in your set system, F, such that if you compute a corresponding polynomial, it computes a Boolean function. So really you can think about union closed set systems equivalently as Boolean functions where there are no cancellations in F squared. And this of raises an interesting possibility of maybe we can use some tools in Boolean function analysis to better understand you know, the union closed set system. So that's the second connection. And now I want to tell you a bit about the proof. Um, but maybe first, are there any questions about this connection? See that question in the chat. Okay. Huh. Yeah, Ryan is saying that, yeah, there, there are tools that work for dense functions, but they don't typically work for sparse systems. Thanks, Ryan. Um, okay, so let me keep going. So tell you a bit about the proof. So what are the ideas? So, uh, Terra, the proof is going to use some ideas that are obviously coming from combinatorics, some ideas that come from Boolean function analysis, and some new tools that we developed to sort of be really try to use probability theory to understand combinatorial structure. So what's the setup again? What are we trying to prove? So you, you have an arbitrary Boolean function, small f, on n bits. And we view it as a polynomial. We look at all its monomials. And we say it has m monomials. And what we want to prove is it has a hidden set of size polylogarithmic in the number of monomials. And notice here, there is no dependence on the number of variables, which is what we expect. Only somehow for some annoying technical reasons, when you want to convert this combinatorial result to this decision tree result, you need to do, lose this log n factor. But let's ignore this for now. So really, this is what we're trying to prove. And again, for the sake of this proof, ignore this file. We're just going to prove some polylog factor. So how are we going to do it? So what you want are some conditions on a set system so that it will guarantee it has a small hidden set. And first thing is we want to remove an obvious obstacle. What is this obstacle? If your set system has many pairwise disjoint sets, it cannot have a small hidden set because for every one of these sets, I will need a different element. Right, if your set system has K, non-empty pairwise disjoint sets, 
you need at least k sets to hit all of them. So then maybe first we can just show that Boolean functions do not have too many disjoint monomials. That's going to be our first step. So this is what we're going to prove the first step. Take an arbitrary Boolean function that has m monomials. The number of disjoint monomials that we have is at most probably log m. They cannot be more than that. And the proof sort of uses sort of standard tools in Boolean function analysis, but I, I'm not sure in this audience you know how many people know of the thing. So I'm going to just maybe take a minute to go through it. And if you don't if you don't know these tools, then maybe just feel free to like you know doze off for a minute, and then we're just going to pick up from there. So that's like the only one place where we are going to use tools from Boolean function analysis. Or if you just know, keep listening. So really, what we're going to prove is the following equivalent form. If f is a Boolean function with h disjoint monomials, they're always disjoint, it has at least exponential in the root h many monomials in total. So you cannot have many disjoint monomials without forcing having many, many more, exponentially more monomials because the function is Boolean. So it's also here that this interplay between being a Boolean function that is combinatorial with you know, this polynomial expression, which is more algebraic. So how are we going to prove this? So here's the proof idea. So first, we're going to say the following thing. If f is an h disjoint monomials, we can try to simplify our life and say, well, maybe every monomial we're going to simplify to a variable. We're going to fix everything outside them. So this is something standard you can do. You can show that f contains a subfunction g on h bits. That is has what we call the maximal sensitivity. It's a value in all zero is some value b, let's say 0, 1. But if I flip every individual bit, I'm going to get the opposite value. So, and of course, and somehow doing this operation doesn't increase the number of monomials, so G is still sparse. And if G happens to be sparse, then what you can show is that you can fix half its variables to zero and basically kill most of its monomials and get it to be a low degree polynomial. And you do that, and then you can just use some known connection between degree and sensitivity of Boolean functions. So again, if you've never seen this thing, this should not be clear. For people in this audience who happen to know something about Boolean function analysis, this is a standard Nissan Zegedi type proof type tool. So there's no new technical components here. So this is okay. So, but the point is showing that your function doesn't have many disjoint monomials is not really, is not enough. And here's an example of a set system. Take all the subsets of n of size of n half plus one. On the one hand, it doesn't contain even two disjoint monomials. But if I wanted to have a hidden set for it, I need to take many elements, n over, n over two. So in general, for set systems, just not having many disjoint sets is not enough to show that you have a small hidden set. So we need something more, some more structure. So what else can we get? So the first, next step is to say, well, maybe we can move from hidden sets, which was this combinatorial problem, to its uh, fractional relaxation, which is called the fractional hidden set. This is the LP relaxation point. So what is the definition? So F is a set system. A fractional hidden set for it of size H is some distribution D over the elements of the universe with the following property. For every set in your set system, and it's a non-empty set, the probability that one of these elements is going to be inside it is at least is, is large, at least one over h. So why is this a relaxation? Because it's easy to show that if your set system had a heating set of size h, then by taking the uniform distribution over this heating set, you get a fractional heating set. So really it's the fractional relaxation for it. And so now we could ask, let's go back to this example of all the set of size n half, n half plus one. So while the minimal heating set is of size n over two, the minimal fractional heating set is of size two, which is good because this seems to be related to having no two disjoint sets. So in particular, if you take the uniform distribution over the elements, then for every set here, your heating is probably at least a half. So maybe that's enough. No, it's not true. You can actually build slightly more complicated examples of set systems, or maybe for that. I'll take, before I tell you about that. 
So if your set system is dense, then having a fraction of heat inset at small doesn't imply having a heat inset at small. But for spot set system, you can just do the standard trick of sampling and doing a union bound and show that these things are equivalent. So really for our purposes, working with fraction of heat inset is equally good because we're in spot set systems. So now we could ask the following combinatorial question. We know if we go back to a Boolean function, we know that its set system doesn't contain many pairwise disjoint sets. Is it true that all such set systems also have small fraction of hidden sets? And the answer is going to be no. You can build examples, you know, slightly more elaborate examples of set systems where there are exponential gaps between the number of pairwise disjoint sets and the minimal size of not just hidden sets, but also fraction hidden sets. So, so far we are seem to be stuck because we started the set system and whatever structure we're happy to find on it, there are examples of other set systems, maybe not coming from Boolean function that sort of show that we don't really expect to find small hidden set or fraction hidden sets. So what can we do? So now it's gonna be the, next, the last step, which is really where a lot of the technical innovation happens, which is we're gonna use this local to global type machinery, which I think is very common in, in various sort of other setups that you know, we study in edited combinatorics, in, in algebra and combinatorics. And we say, well, if you have Boolean functions, we can restrict them to subcubes by fixing a few bits, and they're still going to be Boolean functions. So we can study not just a polynomial that we get, but also restrictions of this polynomial and study their structure. So, what is the main observation that we're going to use in the following observation? Take a Boolean function that has some number of pairwise disjoint monomials. Take any restriction of this Boolean function to subcubes, which we get by just fixing some bits to zeros and ones. Any such restriction is also going to be sparse because it cannot increase the number of monomials by fixing bits to zero and one. So by the same argument, all of them are going to have a small number of pairwise disjoint sets. And now we ask, what can we say about set systems that don't, not only don't have pairwise disjoint sets, but all, in some hereditary sense, don't have many pairwise disjoint sets. And here we can prove they, they have small fractional hidden sets. So this is really the sort of, you know, maybe the last lemma. And here really we had to invent new techniques to prove it. So take any Boolean function, Assume any restriction of it to any subcube has a bounded number k of pairwise disjoint monomials, then the function has a small fraction of hidden set, polynomial size. So something that happens here is by looking at this hereditary condition, we can improve gaps that are for global functions exponential to, to polynomial gaps. And I'm gonna very, very at high level tell you what the proof is you view this fraction and hidden set as a linear program. Linear programs, when you study them, it's usually useful to look on the dual linear programs. They, when you think about them in terms of this function, they give you some nice distributions of monomials, and you can use some rounding mechanisms to find some restriction that have many digital monomials. So again, this is very, very, very vague, but sort of, you know, I would say at least technically that's, that's like a new component here. So let me just summarize and tell you a bit about open problems that came up in this work. So the main take home method is that the monomials of Boolean functions are not arbitrary, they're structured. So basically by looking, by combining the fact that these Boolean functions are Boolean, which is a combinatorial structure, with sort of the fact that there are sparse polynomials, which is an algebraic property, we get a lot of extra structure. And concretely we prove that they have a heating set of polylogarithmic size. And we have some applications for, for in Boolean function analysis. And the proof combines tools from Boolean function analysis, uh, probability and combinatorics, no LP duality. Um, and now I want to tell you about three interesting open problems. So the first obvious one is just to improve the parameters. I mean, nothing much interesting to say about it, except that I believe this log M should be the right answer. But even if it's poly log m, you can get rid of log n. Even that is going to be, you know, very interesting. Because 
conceptually there should not be any dependence on the universe side, which is a number of variables. And we only get it in this very final step of the proof where we convert from hidden sets to end decision trees. And there should probably be a better way to do it. Um, so here are two other problems. One might be closer to many people here, but you know, we study so Fourier, we do Fourier analysis. And so what is a Fourier expansion of a Boolean function? Well, it's exactly the same as a polynomial ex expansion, except that now we view the inputs not as zero one, but as plus one minus one, right? So if you view the Boolean function as a function from minus one, one to the end of zero one, then now the Fourier, the Fourier expansion of this function is exactly just a polynomial computing it. The, 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 the single you know, multilinear polynomial. And now we can ask, can we take this structure that we identified in the zero one case and carry it over to the minus one one case? Can we say something interesting about the structure of the Fourier coefficients of Boolean functions? So, you know, the usual terminology in this field is, is what's called the spectrum. So the spectrum of the Boolean function is the set of its non-zero Fourier coefficients. And then once you have a Boolean function and you care about it over you know, the Fourier domain, you can always do a linear change of basis. So whatever structure you might have to find, it should be invariant to doing a change of basis. And it turns out that the, here's will be the conjecture, the natural conjecture that you would get if you do that. So let me spend a minute going over it because I know some people in the audience sort of like questions about structural Fourier coefficients. So it says, take any Boolean function. If its spectrum has size r, it has only r non-zero Fourier coefficients, then there exists a change of basis. So you can sort of change the basis of the function, get a new function LF, such that its spectrum has a small hidden set. Okay, so if you up to a change of basis, there is a small hidden set. I mean, th there are many other equivalent ways you can phrase this conjecture, but this is like a shorter one. Here's one, I could say. Another equivalent way is to say that there is a subspace of F2 to the N of co-dimension poly log R where the function is constant. So all these things are equivalent. And if you could prove this conjecture, this would prove this log run conjecture in another special case called XO functions where the gadget is XO instead of N. And currently it seems that the tools that we develop don't apply to this XO function. So it, it seems to be a more complicated statement. But again, I think it's a very interesting question to explore. And the last question is this connection to the union closed conjecture, where I'm really hoping, you know, like Ryan was saying before in the, in the comments, in the chat, that, you know, uh, um, Elon Karpas has a paper where he's showing that if the function is dense enough, you can use tools in Boolean function analysis. And what I'm asking here is, can you also do it for very sparse set systems, uh, but somehow using this connection to Boolean functions where there are no cancellations in the monomials? So I think now this is the end of the talk. So thank you. Questions? Uh, so in your main theorem, uh, how does log n crop up? How does, let me go back. So I'll show you how it comes up. That's log a good n. And then log n. Oh, the, the, the log n. Yeah, how does it appear? I mean, where okay. does it... So, so, so you start with saying you have a small hidden set mm -hmm. and you want to build an end decision tree. Mm -hmm. And the only way we know how to do it is by building another model called zero decision tree, which is a standard decision tree, but what you measure is not the depth, but the maximum length of a pathway you query many zeros. The maximum number of zero queries along a pathway, you've got many zeros. Because we know these are... Um, morally equivalent to a decision tree that are easy to construct. And you do that and you need some proxy that tells you when to stop it. And, and the, we don't have a good way of doing it related to the sparsity, only to the number of variables. So it's something in this conversion from hidden set to zero decision trees to end decision trees that is of, you know, well, we're losing this factor depending on the number of variables, probably because we're doing it in the wrong way. But, but no, so I've been spending the last, several months with some colleagues working on this. And, and you study this problem, 
of getting on this log n, and it seems initially like a very simple problem, but there's a lot of deep structure underlying it. So I, I know if you, if you like structural problems, you know, although it seems like a minor technical question, there's a lot of hidden structure inside it. Great, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yes, you will. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I have a question about the, the Fourier conjecture you made. Uh, how, how relevant is the, the Boolean nature of the function there? Could you, does it make sense to ask it for functions just taking values in the interval, or does it not make sense? Well, if it, if it, well, it depends, right? It's going to, if, if, if you have no constraint on the range, then it's false, like no x1 plus x2 plus plus xn, right? Then it has, you know, it's very sparse. There's no small hidden set, but the, the range is like zero up to n. If you replace zero one with like zero one two or anything, any small range, you should probably equivalent. So I, I would guess the, the, the right dependence should be polylogarithm on the sparsity and a polynomial on the range side of the range. I mean, for n functions, we can prove it. So I didn't say it here, but for n functions, we can prove exactly that. If there's no more questions, let's uh, thank Shahar once more.